So wait, wait, let me interrupt you right there with what you're saying, uh, Mr. McGovern. Mr. McGovern, let me interrupt you. Now, you're saying that because of the influence of the uh, Jewish lobby, that basically, not only that it forced Chas Freeman to uh, basically not accept that job, but also ultimately, uh, did Blair lose his job because of that? Is that what you're saying? Um, Blair, uh, as Freeman was appointed... So it is not that he turned down the job, it's that he was removed from the job after a day in office, so to speak. Now, when, when Admiral Blair appointed Chess Freeman, uh, he uh, put uh, many noses out of joint. And particularly, I don't call it the Jewish lobby because it's, by, it's, it's, it's a minority, it's a hard right wing Likud lobby. He did them in. Uh, and it's, clear because uh, Charles Schumer uh, bragged about it and uh, Freeman uh, admitted that's what happened to him. Okay, let me get uh, Philip Giraldi back in on this. Philip, what's your take on that? Do you believe that it was because of the, uh, the uh, for example, APAC, the Jewish lobby influence, that uh, helped Blair basically lose his job? How do you see it? Well, I, I think it was uh, when Blair uh, did appoint Chaz Freeman uh, and was opposed by the lobby, I think that was really the kiss of death. Uh, I agree with Ray absolutely on that, that when that happened, that meant that sooner or later Dennis Blair would be in trouble as soon as there were an opportunity to turn on him. Well, let me interrupt you there. Well, let me interrupt you right there. Phil. What exactly does that say then about... Uh, Washington politics as far as uh, how much influence that the Jewish lobby has? Well, it, what it says is essentially that the Jewish lobby, uh, the Israeli lobby, has, has absolute control over the point, appointment of anyone, either in a security position or a foreign policy position, that has anything at all to do with the Middle East. They basically are able to say yes or no on the appointment of any individual at a senior level, I'm talking about, obviously, a policy-making level. Well, Philip, what does that say about U.S. Over... sovereignty? What does that say exactly about U.S. sovereignty if Israel is basically calling the shots, as you said, in dealing with the Middle East? Then aren't there times that, uh, for example, what Washington, what is good for Washington, may not necessarily be good for Tel Aviv? And if Israel is calling the shots, uh, where does that leave the United States? Well, obviously, that's the, the fundamental dilemma in terms of American foreign policy, and I think Ray would agree with me on this, that essentially the Israeli veto over major aspects of U.S. foreign and security policy means that our policies don't make sense in terms of what the national interest of the United States is. Okay, let me turn back to uh, Ray. Now, what do you think? Do you think that the average American... Uh, realizes, according to what you and Philip are saying, is for as the influence on the Israeli lobby to that extent that they can actually determine American foreign policy. Well, first off, uh, let me point out that never in my experience of almost 50 years in this town have I seen uh, the leak lobby able to derail appointments uh, in the intelligence community at a lower than uh, uh, secretary or principal level. In other words, Chaz Freeman, as important and as educated as he was, fit for the job, he was two rungs lower than anyone I've seen the Likud lobby exercise a veto over. But it is true. Uh, it is true that Americans don't know about this, and the reason they don't, don't know about it is because the Likud lobby is just as powerful in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and all uh, of the, what I call the fawning corporate media, which do not give the American people a chance to learn the real truth. And that's why I admire so much Bill's uh, work and others who are trying to expose this, because uh, not many politicians will run the risk of saying, yes, I had to vote this way. Uh, because uh, APAC gives me so much money, and if I don't vote this way, they will give more money to my uh, opponent next time. That's how corrupt the system is. 
Okay, uh, let, let me get Philip in. I, I'm almost out of time. Philip, one minute on this. So if what you're saying and what Ray is saying is true, does it make a difference then if the person who's called the president is George W. Bush or Obama uh, when it comes to the Middle East? If Israel is call, calling the shots for the United States, what difference does it make who is president? Well, uh, you know, the, the president does have uh, the ability to at least begin to turn this around by by speaking to the American public and saying, look, I mean, we have national interests in the Middle East that are not the same as the interests of Israel, and it's uh, uh, because uh, our economy is in trouble and we're, we're fighting two wars at the present moment. We have to look at those interests in a serious way, and we have to be able to do things that are going to make Israel angry. But that's just the way it is. It requires okay. the president to use the, what they call the bully pulpit to use his position to try to change policy, but I don't think any president from either party at, at the present time would have the courage to do that. Okay, and on that note, I'd like to thank both Philip Giraldi and Ray McGovern for being with us on another close-up look at today's hot stories. Join us right here, same time tomorrow. I'm Marzia Hashimi, signing off from Tehran. Thank you, and goodbye.